Now please uh, welcome Dr Beth Ebert, the Research Program Leader for Weather and Environmental Prediction at the Bureau of Meteorology. Pleased to be here, and uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces, and uh, particularly um, people who come from interstate. It's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to give a, a brief introduction. Uh, I spent a few um, happy hours during the weekend um, looking up information about the history of fire weather in Australia, fire weather prediction, fire weather science, um, and it. There were a couple of really great resources, and I'm sure uh, many of you know much more about this topic than I do. But um, I thought it would be interesting, sort of in a way of setting the scene for the science that we'll be talking about today, um, mainly the science that's happened since Black Saturday. But really there was uh, building on quite a, a long history of work that was going on. Um, and I'd like to start with a, a quote from Ellen MacArthur, from the MacArthur um, Fire Danger uh, Indices. And in 1958, he stated that blow-up conditions are virtually impossible for the Bureau of Meteorology to forecast, although such days probably account for 90% of our total fire damage. The accurate forecasting of such blow-up conditions would be an immense advance in preventing the appalling damage which occurs on such relatively isolated days. So I think um, it's a problem then. It's still a problem that hasn't been completely solved today, but I think we've made some good progress. So I'll just um, take you through very quickly um, what I was able to learn. Um, so the, the first fire weather station that we know about in Australia was, was in WA and, and Tasmania I put in some soon after. There had been a bit of fire science going on in North America, in Canada and the United States. And Australia at this stage, um, which was before Black Friday, but not too long before, started to get serious about fire weather. Um, then, of course, the, the terrible events on Black Friday um, in January of 1939, there were unprecedented in memory of any Australians at that time. And so that really spurred quite a lot of um, fire research getting started, um, because it was recognized that um, people didn't really know how to um, how to approach it, how to handle it, how fire works in the landscape. It was, was based on experience rather than science, so it really got the science going. Um, there was a wonderful report that I think many of you would be familiar with by um, Foley, who was a Bureau of Meteorology climatologist, and he wrote quite a long um, treatise, um, almost 200 pages, on fire weather and talking about what they knew about the processes, which was quite a lot, actually. They knew what kind of synoptic weather situations were likely to um, be associated with really bad fires. Um, they knew a lot about the important effects of wind, of low relative humidity, of high temperatures. And so he was the first person in Australia, I think, to get it all down into a report that was um, could then be used by um, people who were um, concerned with with predicting fire weather. And um, that black and white picture there is um, what they call a hazard stick. Have, have some of you familiar with the hazard stick? Um, I was, this was something that was new to me, but it was, it's, I don't know if they're still used. Does anybody know if they're still used? They were yes. um, very big in Tasmania, but um, by putting your sticks out in, the, out in the field, they absorb moisture or they, or they get rid of moisture and it, as a function of the weather, the humidity, the temperature, the wind, and it tells you something about the flammability of, of sticks of that kind of diameter. And it was used in a lot of um, fire weather prediction for many, many years. So in, um, in the mid-50s, um, Alan MacArthur was appointed the Commonwealth Fire Research Officer, and he was very, very active, um, involved in a lot of conferences, a lot of experimental work. And as, as we all know, the, um, the fire danger um, meter as well. And the Bureau of Meteorology got involved in 1955. We had been providing services, but this, uh, the MET Act, which was, was um, a government, um, gave the Bureau the official mandate to uh, issue warnings for fire weather. So now it was officially part of the service. Um, the first fire weather work workshop was held by the Bureau of Meteorology not long afterwards, uh, in 1958, um, and a lot of um, work that from MacArthur and his team was presented there. 
And the Bureau was also very active in the 1950s as well. Um, around about that same time, and perhaps a result of the workshop, I don't know, um, the CSIRO um, got serious about fire as well and set up a bushfire research section. And they did a lot of laboratory work, particularly. A couple years later, the, the fire danger tables turned into the, the familiar um, round slide rule. And I would say that for a period of um, almost 20 years, um, the CSIRO was really the focus of a lot of the fire behavior research. So experimental work, um, field work. Um, but it sort of tailed off until um, another big event came along, as these things do. You know, they, a big event comes, a lot of activity, a lot of new research, and then it takes until the next big disaster for something to happen. And that was, was Ash Wednesday. At which point the um, CSIRO reinvigorated its, its research through the National Bushfire Research Unit. I think Phil Cheney was the head of that. Um, and another fire weather workshop, which was only 30 or so years after the first one. Um, and this is where it was um, meteorologists and fire agencies and fire practitioners meeting together. And it was something that hadn't happened very often. Um, so it was, was good to. Uh, get that going again. Was was anybody in the room at that second workshop in 1985? Nobody? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Um, and following that, uh, there was a series of, every two years, the Bureau of Meteorology held a fire weather workshop um, that was organized by the severe weather section, I think. Um, and that went along for about 10 years, which, which was really good. Um, one of the uh, innovations that came during that time was the production of wind change charts, so a very practical kind of forecasting tool or um, to, to assist with fire fighting. Um, the Bushfire CRC was established in 2003, uh, originally going to 2009 or 10, but extended after the Black Saturday fires. Um, and a lot of that really invigorated a lot of research. So it was, it was kind of quiet through the 90s, I would say, but. Um, once the CRC was established, it just really took off. Um, one of the big activities, at least on the Bureau side, led by Graham Mills, was using the weather models to look in depth at the processes of fire weather and what were causing extreme days, um, looking at, at dry slots, um, tr transfer of dry air and, and um, high winds from aloft down to the surface, um, looking at circulation patterns, things like that. Um, a lot of climate change work done. Um, Kevin Hennessy was leading some of this work with Chris Lucas. Um, the seasonal bushfire outlook started in the mid-2000s, and that, that was a feature, and that's now a regular thing, as we all know. Um, the Pyrotron in CSIRO, um, really innovative and um, important work looking at uh, experimentally understanding what's happening with, tim with um, embers, what's happening with burn rates, and and fuel and so on, and that's that's really been the evidential base for a lot of the modeling that has, has occurred. Um, fire simulators also were, ha were um, being developed around that time. So Phoenix here in the University of Melbourne and Astralis out in the West both published papers in 2008. There was work on dry lightning that Andrew Dowdy was involved in. Um, terrain effects, Jason Sharp, was this Jason here? I see Jason that did some very innovative work there. Um, the continuous Haynes index that um, Brown and Lockheed McCall worked on. And then the, um, when the Bushfire CRC finished, we um, now have the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. Um, and great work is continuing, but I'm not going to talk about that because we'll hear about that um, here at the workshop today. So I'll, I'll just finish there and um, invite you to enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.